Critical tasks are those we undertake where, if a failure were to occur, the outcome or severity could easily result in a significant injury or loss. When carrying out these critical tasks, it's essential we identify, manage and control all hazards and risks and focus on error traps and the error prevention tools to further mitigate risks. This enables tasks to be completed in a well-planned, safe and productive manner. Your supervisor will identify the activity as a critical task during the preparation and planning phase for the work. This is part of a mandatory process which must be followed, irrespective of the critical task to be undertaken. It's important you understand the process and your role within it, and this module is part of the Dusan Babcock Critical Task Training for Lifting Operations. It will help reaffirm your personal awareness accountability and ownership for these activities, please take time to watch, listen and understand this module. It's important and it will be assessed. A lifting operation becomes a critical task when termed complex as detailed in the following operating procedure for lifting equipment and lifting operations. Prior to any lift or multiple lift, a lifting study must be completed to validate the procedure has been adequately engineered, hazards identified, risks assessed, and the right control measures put in place to ensure a safe lifting operation. Remember, there is no such thing as a generic lifting study. The lifting study will be completed by the task supervisor or a designated responsible person and is the control of work document which must be adhered to. If there is any change or deviation from the lifting study, the lift must cease immediately. Before it can recommence, the appointed person operator, APO, or a responsible person, lifting operations, resident engineer or lifting engineer, must be consulted. The main lifting study must then be revised and amended as appropriate. There are two golden rules. One, no lifting study, no lift. Two, any change or deviation, cease the lift and reassess. There are absolutely no exceptions. The key elements of the lifting study will, as a minimum, classify the lift as simple basic, routine standard or complex. Identify access and escape routes. Describe the load to be lifted. Identify the load weight. Identify the load center of gravity. Identify the crane and slew path. Highlight and detail the lifting equipment to be used and its configuration. Define the communications methods to be used during the lift. Highlight predefined stop points. Prior to the lift commencing, a take five must take place. The Take 5 involves all members of the work party, including the crane driver and or winch operator. Those involved must sign to confirm they have read, understood and agreed to its contents. The Take 5 document covers the task description, transportation, pre-lift checklist, any changes to the lift and team acknowledgement. Let's look at an example. Motor racing is, by its very nature, a dangerous sport. The consequences of a high-speed incident are severe, so risks are assessed at the track and mitigation measures put in place by the organisers to reduce the likelihood of a major incident. From escape roads and chicanes, to crash barriers and energy-absorbent foam, error traps around the circuit have been identified and error prevention tools used to mitigate risks. But should an incident or breakdown occur, a lifting team must be in place to clear the track. Each member of the lifting team must understand their roles and responsibilities in performing any lift. The team leader develops a lift plan, his version of a lifting study, which will allow everyone within the team to get a clear picture of the operation. The lifting team assemble before the race to discuss any potential lifts which may be required. It's in these pre-race discussions, their version of a take five, that the lifting team consider potential error traps 
and error prevention measures to ensure everyone is fully prepared. It's important that the team have identified potential hazards, assessed the risks and put in place mitigation measures so that any potential lift can be carried out safely. And during the race, the inevitable happens. But the team have prepared meticulously. They've identified the potential error traps and used error prevention tools. Good leadership, meticulous planning and preparation, effective briefings and ownership of the task by everyone involved have all played their part in a successful and safe lift. Now let's look at an example from the workplace. A spool piece weighing 2.4 tonnes was to be lifted directly from delivery transport into position using a 400 tonne crane. Prior to the lift, a problem was identified with the spool which required remedial work at the site workshop. In the interim, the 400 tonne crane left site and there were also problems with access to the original lift location. This meant an alternative transport route, new location and method of lifting would be required. The new procedure involved two cranes with different slew paths, each taking the spool over live plant and equipment. The change of scope was not fully risk assessed and no new paperwork was created. The spool was slung prior to transportation using one ton and two ton round slings respectively. The spool was lifted onto a flatbed lorry for transportation with the lift slings left in place. On arrival, the spool was lifted using a 130 ton crane which slewed east 180 degrees over live pipework before lowering the spool to ground again, leaving the lift slings in place. The spool was then lifted using a 55 ton crane which planned to slew west 180 degrees again over live pipework before lowering the spool to its final position. During this process, the slinging arrangement failed with the spool falling to ground, damaging a seal oil skid and associated pipework. So what went wrong and where were Dusan Babcock's lifting standards and expectations not met? The original lifting plan had changed, but no amendments were made to the lifting study or documentation. The spool piece rigging and transfer was carried out under the general lifting study and permit when it was a complex lift over live equipment. The system in place at the time allowed for a general lifting plan and permit for items up to one tonne in weight. The weight of the spool was not known. No one researched or calculated the weight. The rigger knew that anything above one tonne would require a far more in-depth study and hence guessed the weight at around one tonne. There was no record of the rigging method used for transport to and within the fabrication workshop. Prior to lifting onto the flatbed lorry, the Dusan Babcock riggers, a rigger plus apprentice, used a combination of one ton, six meter endless round sling and a two ton, three meter endless round sling. The spool center of gravity was not known and the slings were of insufficient capacity for the weight. There was also no packing material protecting the slings from sharp edges. The slinging arrangement was incorrect, which reduced the capacity even further. The simplest calculation showed that the slinging arrangement had a capacity for 0.7 tonne without further reduction for the choke. The sling was not removed or changed when lifted by either the 130 tonne crane or the 55 tonne crane. It was on the fourth consecutive lift that the slings failed. The accident would have been avoided if the correct critical task process had been followed. And finally, remember that a take five can be called to reassess the risk at any time during the task. If other hazards are identified, stop the job and reassess. If things change, stop the job and reassess. If you're unsure, stop the job and reassess. Thanks for watching.